Okay, no more loud laughing. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you very much for the uh, the invitation to come. And uh, uh, you know, initially I questioned whether this this uh, fit in the scope of of the data sciences um, series. But uh, after talking to folks today, uh, hopefully it'll it'll be an interesting uh, topic. Um, I want to start. With, uh, with acknowledgments, uh, start with uh, the, the huge set of people who've, who've helped with this in one form or another, um, and particularly the funding from, uh, well, that doesn't work, the funding from uh, NIH and, and DOE. So uh, let, me, let me get started with a geography lesson. Um, oh, okay, cool. So we're on the east side of the state. <laughs> I <laughs> just thought I'd, you know, start there. Um, thank you. And uh, we're about uh, 4,000 plus uh, staff members. It's a Department of Energy National Lab, one of 17 labs. Uh, it's a multi-purpose lab, so it's, it's sponsored, stewarded by the Office of Science, but we work across the board in, you know, a lot of work with NIH, different parts of the Department of Energy. Um, we have about a billion dollar uh, R&D uh, expenditures budget. So it's, it's a significant uh, source of uh, S&T research in, in the state of Washington. Uh, now for this audience, what I'm really emphasizing here is at the bottom. Um, we're not that far, okay? It's a 25 minute flight if your pilot doesn't get sick. And um, it's, uh, we, we are constantly looking for people who are interested in joint appointments, folks who are interested in coming. We have a visiting faculty program. And of course, we have a very large number of internships year round and, uh, and lots of job postings. So, you know, I would encourage you, don't, don't judge P&L by what you hear from me today. Um, ch check us out. Uh, we, have, we have a huge program in data science. Uh, the computing presence at P&L is, is about 400, 500 people strong and uh, continuously growing. We also have offices in, actually two offices in Seattle. So uh, one is in South Lake Union on Dexter Avenue. The other is actually the Alumni House uh, here on campus. Uh, where the Northwest Institute for Advanced Computing resides, um, and then offices uh, around the U.S. as well. So that's the geography lesson. Okay, so, so why is this a data science uh, talk, or um, you know, what, what topics do I hope to cover if I go quickly enough? So first I have to tell you uh, what, what the domain is, why, why anyone would care about biomolecular solvation, what is biomolecular solvation. Uh, but the meat of the talk really touches on three areas. The first is model uncertainty. Now, not formal model uncertainty, although there's elements of that, but more like saving users from themselves. There is enough imperfections in the types of models that we use for biomolecular solvation that a lot of attention needs to be paid on how to remove bias, how to remove uncertainty by the way those models are created and used. And interestingly, we solved that data problem with physics. So I'm going to tell you uh, the, the, the part, bullet two there will be essentially a chemical physics um, talk. But even when we have a perfect model, the way we parameterize the model is subject to uncertainty. It's, a, it's, it's typically an inverse problem. We do dimensionality reduction. We lose degrees of freedom. It's not a perfect mapping. So the second part is going to be getting a handle on how much uncertainty is left after we've done the best possible job with the model. And the third part I hope to get to um, is uh, actually has a Dr. Strangelove as, as the intro slide, which is, you know, how I learned to stop worrying and embrace model uncertainty. And actually the ways in which the uncertainties associated with different models uh, can complement one another and give you better accuracy and better predictive power. So I realize this is a diverse audience, so I could either go really slowly and give you a pedagogical background on biomolecular solvation and I watch people fall asleep. Um, except maybe Tom, uh, or I could go very quickly, and that's what I'm going to try to do. I, I want to hit some of the high points, um, hit the themes. I know the slides are available, um, but I would encourage you, please don't wait to the end to ask questions if, if something doesn't make sense or if you don't know why anyone would care about biomolecular salvation after the first few slides. Stop me and ask why. So um, biomolecules, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, sugars, things like that, they're charged molecules, they're charged entities, and they exist in an aqueous environment. They're surrounded by water. So when we think about the role that those charges play, 
in governing the chemistry and the physical structure of biomolecules. We have to think about their environment because water is a highly polarizable material. It moves around in responses to changes in the configuration of those charges. And it's impossible to think about the structure and the energetics of those charges without having some treatment of the water environment around it, which is great, except that there's a lot of waters around any given biomolecule, and that poses a tremendous challenge for modeling. So I think you can see where this is going in terms of model uncertainty. If we want to make progress, we have to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. So that's going to be kind of the key theme. How do we do that in a principled way that introduces the least amount of error into our model and hopefully makes the, uh, uh, the user have a fairly straightforward process of generating accurate predictions? Oops. Okay. So um, we measure our system with quantities of interest. Uh, the quantity of interest that most of you who, who have had some exposure to PCHEM care about is, is thermodynamic for variables like free energy. They're state variables of the system. They depend on the state of the system at any given time. And the nice thing is that they can be calculated by these very high dimensional integrals, um, which are called partition, figure, uh, partition functions or configurational integrals. What these do is they take a probability of a given configuration and they integrate over the degrees of freedom in the space. Then we do something to perturb the system, calculate another version of this configuration integral, and we look at ratios. It basically tells us how the volume of the phase space changes from place to place in the system as we make perturbations to the system. So there's other quantities that we care about. One's called the free energy. It's just the log of this. So free energy differences are another way to think about those ratios of volumes. And then potentials of mean force are what we get when we only integrate over part of the space. They are essentially the starting point for some of the dimensionality reduction we'll talk about in a bit. But they're motivated by statistical physics. They're motivated by the idea that there are often bath variables in the system variables of lesser interest. You need to consider their influence, but you don't need to model them explicitly, so you integrate over them. So this is the potential mean force. And the thing to point out here is that for proteins, um, for nucleic acids, and especially for those objects surrounded by water, N, the dimensionality of the system can be very, very high. And that's what we need to deal with with these models. So I mentioned that we care about solvation. And since our quantity of interest is this configuration integral or its log, which is the free energy, we're going to primarily focus on solvation free energy. Um, this is a number that we can often, at least indirectly, connect to experiment. It allows us to understand our systems, understand their accuracy. Um, it's generally not something you measure directly for a big molecule like a protein. But for many of these systems, it's one of the best handles we have on how accurately um, our models are performing. So, I mentioned earlier that these free energies that we're interested in are simply state functions. So we can consider two states. The simplest model of solvation considers a protein all by itself in some idealized environment, like a vacuum, and then the protein surrounded by the solvent. That's the thing we're trying to model. Um, because these are two discrete states, a lot of the quantities we care about are just differences between the free energies in those two states. So, so how do we tackle this problem? Again, if we have a protein or even an ion, we're going to have a lot of environmental variables to think about. Thousands and thousands of degrees of freedom in the system, or millions for some, and that is an impossible integral to sample and converge directly. So we have to think about how we're going to do our sampling strategy or how to simplify the dimensionality of the integral. How do we make this an easier problem to solve? That's the dimensionality piece. So the model we're going to talk about starts with all of these water molecules treated in explicit atomic detail, integrated. So you think about that potential of mean force I introduced. Our bath variables are going to be their water and their influence on the system. We're going to integrate over all of their possible configurations. And then we're going to pretend it looks something like this. This is called a continuum dielectric. The dielectric behaves like each of these water molecules they will polarize, that is, they'll point their dipole or their charges 
to offset the charge of the solute. That's what a dielectric or a dipolar solvent does. You can think about a limit where we take each of these dipoles, these explicit little spherical things, and we shrink them. And as we shrink them, they become a continuum. And instead of having individual water molecules polarize, the continuum polarizes. That's our dimensionality reduction step. It's a typical physical argument. It takes you from things like molecular dynamics and atomic simulations up to the types of things that mechanical engineers often think about with bulk materials, bulk systems, compressibilities, and things like that. There's a lot of assumptions that go with this. I'm not going to, you know, in the interest of time, belabor those. But some of these assumptions are things that we're going to want to tease out when we think about the uncertainty that a user experiences when they use a model like this. And that's, that's going to be the focus of the, the first third of the talk. Okay. Um, the other nice thing, and, and probably the reason I became a computational uh, a chemist or biophysicist, is because we don't have to worry about reality. We can take this state function diagram, and we can break it down any way we want. So even though, you know, the semi-real, the only real version of the protein in this diagram that has anything to do with reality is the one where it looks like this in solution. If we take that protein and drop it in a vacuum, it's going to look like something else entirely. And certainly these things are totally fictitious. But it gives us a way to decompose the problem and to think about the assumptions and the errors we introduce at each step of that decomposition. So it's taking our overall dimensionality reduction and it's breaking it into a series of steps where maybe the assumptions we're making are not that bad or they're at least easier to bound. And that's going to be key for thinking about how to improve the model or at least understand where some of the sources of error are coming from. So in the interest of time, I'm going to break this into some very simple pieces and go fairly quickly through them. We think about this solvation energy process as this fictitious cycle. And the first step in the cycle is actually kind of cute. We make a bubble that looks exactly like our protein in the solution. That's actually an easy thing to think about. There's no real detail or interesting electrostatics in the protein. It's just a bubble. And there's theories that describe how we make that bubble. The next thing we do is we tack on the fact that inside the bubble, there's atoms that have weak interactions. They're called Van der Waals or Leonard Jones types of interactions with the solvent and with each other. So we'll build those in next, and we'll calculate that energy difference. And then the next step is to charge these things up, turn on the charges on all the atoms. We're going to think about each of these discreetly, and we have a term in our model that describes each of these stages. And that will be our starting point for thinking about how to describe biomolecular solvation. Now, the other important point is that there's ways to tie all of these terms back to the structure and back to the properties of the solvent. That's what each of these equations represents, is we take some characteristic function that describes the solvent, usually something that says, hey, there's no solvent overlapping with the protein, and there is solvent outside the protein. And we use that as the basis for describing the shape of our protein, as well as describing some of the properties of the solvent. So nonpolar pieces represent the pieces without charge. It turns out that there's a classic result from uh, it goes way back to the 20s, but Frank Stillinger um, really popularized it, called scaled particle theory, that describes how to make bubbles in solution. It's awesome. The next piece involves the charges. This is classic continuum electrostatics, something you learn in you know, undergrad physics, and it says that if we have a dielectric material, there's two terms that determine the energy. One looks at the sort of capacitance type term, how we polarize the material, and the other is you know, charges time potential. So that's our simple model for how we think about um, the protein and its interaction with the dielectric around it. So these are independent models. They've been developed independently. They've been used independently. The question is, do they make any sense when we apply them to things we care about in biology or biophysics? And in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about ions today. So, so although it looks ugly, we can put it all back together. And we take all these different pieces of the model that we got um, from pulling apart that solvation energy cycle and treating the steps through these fictitious uh, states. And we get back this, this free energy functional that depends on things like the pressure and surface tension. Those are properties of the solvent. Chi, which describes the distribution of the solvent around the molecule. But again, it really just describes the shape of the molecule. And then some electrostatic properties and the ion stuff that I think we'll, we'll just ignore. So 
This is the thing that we want to evaluate for our system. This is the thing that ideally, if we have the right descriptions for the electrostatic potential and for chi, we can connect to experiment. But we got this by assembling a whole bunch of little models, all of which had been developed independently and putting them back together. So when a user or the person who's trying to actually apply this model to a system that they care about comes about it, they're presented with kind of a big mess. They've got a lot of choices to make here. There's a lot of coefficients that they have to pull out and try to find the best value for their problem. And it becomes a massive overfitting task, right? It becomes a problem where, well, they, they may choose each one of these independently to give exactly the right answer for that case and for no other case, no transferability. So that is actually what we were trying to address in terms of the accuracy. Now there's a class of models that come from treating this as a variational problem. So you assume that there's some fixed value for the solvent that's really just a geometric description of where water can and can't go around your molecule. And then when you take a derivative with respect to the electrostatic potential, you get what's called the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. It's very exciting, lots of people have solved it. We've solved it too. Um, it has many, many caveats associated with it. And many of these caveats are what affect the users. So we've spent some time over the past, I guess, 20 years now, um, developing software to help people solve this equation because it's extremely important in biomedicine, in biophysics, for understanding and designing proteins. And, you know, it's, it, it's not a nasty partial differential equation as partial differential equations go, but it's not something you would hand to a pharmaceutical chemist and say, good luck. So we've developed software. It has, we have about 27,000 users worldwide um, using that software. And that means we probably have, you know, uh, something to the 27,000th power ways to misuse the software. So a lot of what we deal with in, in this is trying to help protect users from themselves. And a lot of what they run into is where did all these little models that you glued together come from? So that was the sort of fundamental problem we were trying to address in the first, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about. So the, the title of this section is Reducing That Uncertainty. It's, it's kind of I'm using uncertainty with air quotes here, um, through model integration. Is there a way to actually help the user by taking away choices from them? So, you know, go from a, 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 a liberal democracy or anarchy um, down to a dictatorship where we tell you exactly what goes into this model. And the way we went about that was actually through physics. We said, you know, we treat these models as independent models, but they're not really. Underneath them, there's a set of constraints. Those constraints are actually geometric constraints. Can we use that to make, to reduce the parameter space and to make it easier for users to fit um, or use ab initio uh, parameters for their, for their particular problem? So uh, all we do in this case to integrate these models is we say, you know, let, let's assume that we don't know everything as computational chemists, we, we, we can make states up, but we actually don't know some, some additional pieces of information. And one of those pieces of information is the shape of the solvent around the system. We're gonna treat that as another field, kind of like the electrostatic potential, that we don't know, but we want to solve for. And the way we're gonna solve for it is by taking another derivative in this problem. We're gonna do another minimization, this time simultaneously with respect to the solvent density and with respect to the electrostatic potential. Um, we're gonna tie some things in this equation more specifically to the structure. Um, these are actually the constraints I was referring to. And what these constraints are gonna do is link the two models we were treating independently. They're specifically, if you think back or if you remember the part of the talk where I was talking about bubbles, they're going to link that bubble part of the talk and the uncharged atom part of the talk to the charged atom part of the model. It's gonna put those together. So we're putting in constraints, and by adding those constraints, we're actually reducing the number of choices the users can make that typically get them in trouble. So, so that's, that's pretty much what's on this slide. So uh, when you do that, you do some variational calculus. It's, it's, it's very fun. And you get back two coupled partial differential equations. Um, the first one is just a kind of another version of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, which is great. All the solvers we've made don't need to be massively rewritten. There's, there's things that we can reuse, and also it's still interpretable. A lot of insight has been built up around the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. We don't want to upend it all. Um, the second piece here 
is actually another very popular equation. It gets used more in differential geometry to describe flow or diffusion on curved manifolds. It's something called the Laplace Beltrami uh, uh, equation or the Laplace Beltrami operator here. So it really describes how this solvent around a biomolecule is going to evolve or flow to fit the shape of the biomolecule. And that represents our constraints. We actually have a constraint that describes, you know, the solvent has some properties. It can under, only undergo a certain amount of curvature, can only be stretched so far, and it has to evolve under a flow that describes the physics of the system. So um, I think I'm going to skip over the, some of the details of the computation and tell you what this, this results in. Um, so what we do when we solve these equations is we evolve the solvent density around the molecules, and you can see how it, it kind of pr progresses over time to give a surface that then describes where solvent can and can't go. Before, the users had to make a choice for this. Now physics drives their choice. It's, it, it sounds awful, but they have no more choices to make. Um, now, the hope is that by removing these choices, they still get accurate answers, and I'll talk about that in a second. The other interesting piece, and, and this kind of points to the social dimension of these models, is that in the same way that they didn't totally upend how we think about um, Poisson-Boltzmann electrostatics, they also didn't totally upend how we think about what the surface of a protein in solvent looks like. Again, there's a lot of intuition built into the specific way that we fill in the nooks and crannies of the surface of a protein with water molecules. A lot of medicinal chemists have think about how they design their drugs that way. A lot of people who think about protein-protein interaction have intuition based on this. And more importantly, this is actually the number one use of our software is to make pretty pictures where the blue regions equal positive potential and the red regions equal negative. So, we didn't want to upend the way users were interpreting the data, but we wanted to remove some of the robustness. So, so we, we, we definitely didn't do that either. The question is, did we do anything that was accurate? Um, so what we used is a set of small molecule solvation energies. Um, this is kind of one of those gold da standard data sets that when someone publishes it, everyone in the community gloms onto it because it's one of the few ways we can benchmark uh, these types of calculations. The data set, um, is, is relatively small, it's actually a subset of a larger data set, but it allowed us to test things that users are already using in this new constrained environment where they have fewer choices. And so what we did is we, we, we took these tip, typical force fields, we took typical um, charge sets, typical radii sets, and we also asked could we use experimental values for water surface tension and internal pressure. So that left one degree of freedom, and I didn't spend a lot of time talking about this, but something called the dielectric constant. What is the polarizability of the inside of a molecule? It's actually a meaningless question. It's, it's kind of philo philosophical. Um, the, the link scales at which you define a dielectric are much, much bigger than the dimensions of a molecule, so it becomes essentially a free parameter. Interestingly, so we're, here we're looking at error with respect to the experimental data in terms of the one free parameter in the system, and you see you get, so this curve performs the best, it's one of the popular uh, choices for charges and radii, and it bottoms out around 1.5, which actually isn't too far from what is thought to be the, if you have a, a, a weakly polarizable solid, then the dielectric is thought to be somewhere between 1.5 and 1.8. So you can even kind of wave your hands and say, hey look, it seems physically reasonable. But the point is, is that we went from a very large set of free parameters constrain them by coupling the models, and then um, got results that, you know, they're not perfect, but they're, they're not bad. They, they compete with the state of the art. We can also look at um, what happens if we allow some, if we give a few more degrees of freedom back to the user, what does it do in terms of the overall accuracy that they get? And what you see, this black line here represents um, the minimum error and these contour plots represent error of the predictions with respect to uh, the experimental data. And the interesting thing is our best approximation lies in the same valley. So if, if you take and you allow the pressure, for example, which could be experimentally determined, to be a completely floating parameter, it lies in the same minimum as the experimental value. Likewise with the surface tension. 
lies in the same valley as the optimum. So you sacrifice very, very little energy by again taking more choices away from the user and saying, no, please stick with the physically reasonable, the experimentally measured values. So I wanted to start with this, A, because it provides some context um, to, uh, to, to what comes next. It actually tells you about solvation. Uh, maybe you didn't know about it before, maybe you didn't care, you may still not care. But it also talks about another interesting choice that we've run into, which is when you release software, even just an abstract model, into the wild, and you open up all of the different ways in which people can use the model, they do very bad things. Not, not intentionally, they just, they're not experts, right? They wanna use it to make a picture, they wanna use it to understand a problem. So um, this, this discovery, which was not so obvious to me, but was actually obvious to some of the social scientists and psychologists that I talked to, um, not, not as a result of the research, but actually in understanding data science and how people interact with models better, is that you know sometimes having a model with relatively few knobs that get, generates reasonably accurate results can be a lot more powerful than exposing the whole you know overwhelming parameter set of 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 the of the model, and that, that was an important insight for me. And it's actually driven a lot of the ways in which we're doing model development now thinking less about the expert user, which is usually us and maybe you know 2% of the overall community, and thinking a lot more about that 98% of the community that really doesn't need to be exposed to all of these details. Again, it seems like kind of a trivial conclusion, but, uh, but it's, it's made a big difference in how people use the software. So uh, for the bulk of, uh, of the remaining time, I wanna talk about a different kind of uncertainty, because again, that last uncertainty was sort of uncertainty with air quotes. Um, this uncertainty, is, uh, is, is really what you find when you think about uncertainty quantification. So um, this is the same model as before. Um, I'm only showing one part of it, but I wanna talk a little bit more about things we can know and things we don't know. So as I mentioned, there's already some ambiguity in which solvent model we choose. You may choose to use the overconstrained dictatorial uh, geometric flow model, or you may choose to use the older model. So there's some uncertainty there. You may choose to describe the surface the way we were describing it with the differential geometry. You may choose to use other popular definitions. Beyond that, you have to pick things like how big is an atom? That's a, that's a very hard question to answer because it's not particularly well defined. What is the charge on an atom? Same sort of thing. Um, what are the properties of the solvent? Even if we knew the, sol the solvent um, and we knew we were gonna take experimentally measured values for the solvent, we don't actually know those values to infinite precision. Um, so there's each of these components that we use to build this model has uncertainty associated with it. And perhaps the biggest one, although arguable, is input confirmation. Now those of you who think about statistical thermodynamics or molecular simulation should be saying, now wait a second, input confirmation isn't fixed. It's something we need to sample. It's something we need to integrate over. And you're absolutely right. The problem is a lot of people who do drug docking, who do structural biology, who look at these systems, think about the input structure as a gold standard, right? Ooh, this is what came from the database. It must be right. Or this is what came from the database. It has these funny B factor things associated to it. There must be a little bit of noise, but it's still, it's what came from the database. It must be right. And you know, there's a good reason to, to, if you don't know a lot about StatMac or if you're not that familiar with structural biology, there's a good reason to say, yeah, okay, it's my input confirmation. It's what got published, I'm gonna use it. But we would like to know how all of these assumptions influence the types of results that you get out of these model. And so we turn to a technique called uncertainty quantification. It's been around for a very long time. Um, it's been uh, examined and, and sort of explored in many different ways. Um, some of you probably remember the horrible lesson that gets taught to analytical chemistry students and presumably others of, oh yeah, just take derivatives and square them. Everything will be fine, it'll work out. Um, that's probably not the best guidance, it's not everything is Gaussian, uh, although in this talk we make a lot of Gaussian approximations. Um, and then the other problem is that, you know, if you, if you go back, to, if you go to a more sophisticated method like Monte Carlo sampling, most of these systems, as I emphasized before, are extremely high dimensional. So what do we do? If we wanted to understand the uncertainty in properties like solvation energy, or even simple properties like how exposed is a residue to solvent? That's a question that's often asked to understand how titration state changes happen, 
or to think about footprinting type of experiments or drug docking. How sensitive is that to the, the input that, and the assumptions we make that this is the right conformation for a molecule? And this just shows two different structures, for example, from a, uh, 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 from a database. Even though they're of the same molecule under very similar conditions, even then there, isn't, there obviously isn't one fixed structure. So um, this is work that was driven by uh, two very talented uh, early career scientists at PNNL, uh, Xu Yang and Huan Lei. Um, and they tackled this problem head on, recognizing that this system was far too high dimensional to do any sort of traditional sampling. We needed to use some sort of technique to simplify the problem. And we actually used two techniques um, to address overfitting challenges and to address um, the dimensionality. So one was a surrogate model. And the surrogate model was designed to allow us to explore the way quantities of interest, like surface area or solvation energy, changed with respect to changes in the input variable. But the surrogate model didn't have to be as expensive and didn't have to be as fancy as the original input model, because really it was just kind of like our guideposts. It said, oh, go here to get a better answer. Explore this region. It drove where we sampled, but it didn't necessarily predict the answers with the level of accuracy we would need um, to, to actually bound the uncertainty. The other thing we used was compressed sensing because we were going to be using many, many more degrees of freedom um, to represent uh, our system in this surrogate model than we would have input sampling points. We needed a way to regularize the problem. It was ill-conditioned. We needed to set as many coefficients to zero as possible. So those are the two techniques. So if you fall asleep now, we dealt with high dimensionality by thinking about surrogate models, so they're not perfect, right? They're just ways to explore the system cheaply. And then we use compressed sensing or you know, lasso regression, it has all sorts of fancy names, to drive down um, terms in our expansion to zero. Okay, so our starting point um, was those things called B factors I mentioned that come with uh, a protein structure. B factors are also known as Debye-Waller factors because they represent um, in a perfect crystal that is completely harmonic, how would the system fluctuate? And so they're directly related to the size of the fluctuations of any atom given its packing in a crystal. That's cool because I said harmonic, right? And even though I was making fun of people using Gaussian statistics a little while ago, the harmonic model lets us use Gaussian statistics, which just makes things so much nicer. Now in theory, we could do other distributions as well. It's, uh, in fact, we have some work on going on that, but, but this is a good starting point. It also allows us to, you know, use this kind of spherical cow description of how atoms move around in the system. Because the only information we have about our system from the input crystal structure is where are the atoms on average and how do we describe how they fluctuate. And the model that describes how they fluctuate is fundamentally harmonic. So that's our starting point. That's one way to develop a surrogate for the system, which we might otherwise describe with very expensive uh, molecular dynamics calculations or, or, you know, more experiments or something like that. So given that model, we can then set up uh, um, random variates that sample the same um, uh, set of fluctuations. So that's what we're doing down here. Uh, for those of you familiar with this, this is easy to do. We do a Cholesky decomposition and we can start with, uh, with normal variates um, and consider a higher dimensional space by using the covariance matrix that comes from this harmonic model. And for the rest of this part, we're gonna talk about the target property as um, uh, chi, uh, well, chi is the, uh, the random variate and X is the, uh, the quantity of interest. So, okay. so. What we want to do is use a technique called generalized polynomial chaos. This is used a lot in the community. We are by no means uh, the inventors. We are consumers. Um, and if you look at it, it, it really is going to boil this problem down to a regression problem. We have a basis set, and we want to use this basis set to represent how our quantity of interest changes as we move through this random space. So the chi represents the random variates. They're the variates that describe the uncertainty in our input variables, the, the fluctuations in the positions of the atoms, and the X is the thing we care about. It might be solvation energy, might be solvent accessible surface area. And we're just gonna expand it in a set of basis functions. That's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, 
And in fact, if we have um, a nice uh, an error distribution like, a, like a, a Gaussian, but others will work too, we can find orthogonal polynomials for this basis expansion, which is even nicer. So then we're able to represent um, our problem more as a collocation problem. That's helpful because we can't know this whole space of how our quantity of interest changes with random variables, variables exactly. We have to pick points out of it and use them to guide how we tune these coefficients of the expansion. And that's all we do. We treat it as a regression problem and we take some of these points, some of these collocation points, that's where we do a high level calculation or we do an experiment, we plug it into the model and then we refine our coefficients and we repeat until something pleasant happens or the whole method blows up because sometimes it blows up. It, uh, it particularly blows up if you pick the wrong order for your polynomials. So, so, so what does this um, look like in practice? So as I mentioned before, if we could use as many sampling points as we had coefficients, we'd have a great system. It'd look like a least squares problem. Everybody would be happy. Um, we wouldn't really have a lot to worry about except maybe some degeneracy um, in the sampling. But these are expensive calculations and this is a very high dimensional space. So we have a massively ill-posed problem. And that's where this technique of this L1 minimization or lasso regression or compressed sensing comes about. We don't just solve the typical regression problem, which is, you know, this is basically least squares. We also regularize it by a condition that tries to minimize a norm on the coefficients. And the typical norm is L1. There's other norms that you'd like to use, but they make the optimization problem much harder. But that's the approach. So I mentioned earlier, we're making sure that we don't overfit by driving as many of these coefficients as possible to zero. Now, um, Juan and Xu are both very talented mathematicians, so they always make sure I put in this caveat here that this works empirically. It's very difficult to prove, except for simple systems, that compressed sensing actually converges um, and represents an optimal solution. So we, you know, I should probably should make this flash or something or, or put stars around it, but, but you know, caveat emptor. In fact, it seems to work uh, under a wide range of conditions. So, so what does this mean? Um, this is unfortunately for an awful lot of work, it's a very boring slide, um, but it gives you a feeling for how these types of techniques. So I'm gonna go through the different curves here. The red curve is Monte Carlo. It's the brute force approach to uncertainty quantification. I sample as many points from that random variate space as possible, and I recalculate the quantity of interest at each point, and then I use that to assess the distribution. So in this case, I took a very simple quantity of interest, solvent accessible surface area of a residue. This might tell you how likely it is to react or to change charge state or something like that. So Monte Carlo is gonna serve as my ground truth with a million samples. Beyond that, I took two ways to um, do, to do s simpler samples, something called a sparse grid method. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail there, although this is a standard method. It actually turns out to behave very badly. One of the things Juan discovered with this study was that when you have round off error, rather than perfect measurements or perfect calculations, you can actually get really terrible behavior from this method. And when you regularize it with the compressed sensing and do a couple other tricks that he and Shu came up with, you can get much, much better behavior. So it's a really cool result that I'm completely glossing over. And if, you, if I see Juan, I'll apologize. Um, so now let's look at these two results. This is compressed sensing. So this is basically the approach that I showed you. But instead of using a million samples, we use 300 samples. So we take this high dimensional system and we can pick a relatively small number of points a small number of, they could be experiments, in our case they were expensive calculations, and we can reproduce the distribution. And that's exciting because so many of the approaches in chemistry and bi biology fail for higher dimensional systems. This allows us to tackle some of those, and you'll see some other implications of that in a couple of slides. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll t I won't talk so much about the, the error convergence. The other thing, um, one of the tricks that I alluded to that Shu came up with 
was doing um, what many people do anyway when they analyze uh, molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo data sets. It's essentially a principal component um, type of analysis. What it amounts to is a rotation. So as you're defining your random variates and exploring that space, you're constantly moving the space to capture the maximum variation in the thing that you care about. That's also very effective. Um, it helps you uh, reduce the number of data points you need. It ends up with a more accurate model. And as you can see, it actually uh, gives some, some pretty robust um, uh, results. OK. So, so let's think about a more interesting problem now. Not, not that you know uh, bovine trips and pancreatic inhibitor isn't, isn't interesting. But, but um, let's think about a real practical one now, which hits a lot of people who are thinking about protein design or drug docking or prediction. And that is, what do I pick for radii and charges for my molecules? Now, if you're Tom and you have a big computer, you can do a high-level quantum calculation, and some of these things become moot. But you can't do that for every protein. You can't do that for every small molecule. You need approximations. And making these approximations, assigning charges and radii to a molecule, is really a very ill-posed problem itself, and it introduces a lot of error and uncertainty into the model. So what we did is we took that same data set that I talked about before. Again, you know, when you get a good ground truth data set, you kind of beat it to death. Um, and then took popular charge sets, or, whoops, sorry, radii sets and charge sets from the literature. These are things that people use routinely in these types of calculations. And we asked the question, I wonder how much sensitivity there is in the solvation energy that people calculate to these types of inputs. That's important because a lot of these problems are optimization problems. When a new molecule comes in, sometimes people will just take one of these, uh, pro these uh, force fields and kind of uh, mudge it into the right place, right? They say, oh, well, that kind of looks like the other atom over there, so I'm going to assign that charge. Or, you know, that this, this isn't exactly the Martini model atom I was using, but yeah, it's close enough. I'm going to use that. So, so we wanted to have some understanding and a way to measure what, that, uh, what, what the impact of that was on things you care about. So um, an interesting thing is, so we went through the same basic approach, right? This time our random variates were not Gaussians. So I didn't get completely stuck on Gaussians. Some of them were Poisson type distributions. Some of them were uniform variates. Um, we sampled across those and these two axes here represent the major directions of variation across those, those parameter sets. So this is the major direction of variation across all the radii. This is the major direction of variation across all of the charges. And the interesting result, so this is kind of you know, what you get when you start to assemble that response service. The interesting result is that these things, although you can't see it in the lighting, sorry, is they're visually very different. So you can just move a little bit around the parameter space and you start to get qualitatively different answers in terms of the visualization. That's scary because again, one of the major uses for this type of software and these types of calculations is in the structural biology community to say, hey, my drug molecule looks exactly like this and therefore it binds exactly like that. Well, what happens if it actually looked more like that or it looked like the one over there or the one down here? Then the other thing that, that, that matters is, is how well do these, these things do at predicting um, the accurate solvation energy. That's the, the quantitative version of it. Um, just, uh, just briefly, I'll say that the method continued to, to scale pretty well. Um, you know, it, all of these are going to scale uh, worse than linear. That's expected. But uh, the nice thing is that they don't scale exponentially which is what would have happened if you did just done uh, some sort of brute force sampling. So the interesting take home message here, and probably not too surprising, but serves as a word of caution, is that when you use these techniques and you explore that space, you see massive sensitivity in the results. So taking, as someone who has, I admit, taken force field parameters and say, ah, oh, it looks about right. I'm going to plug that one back in over there. Um, yeah. <laughs> be very careful. Um, the other thing is that if you develop a new parameter set, which I know some of you in the audience are doing, um, you can actually use a technique like this to understand the sensitivity. You know, really, if you were designing these things, you might like to design, well, first you'd like to get the right answer. That's the vertical line, right? But you'd also probably like to minimize sensitivity to small changes of your force field. So you'd not only like to get the right answer as your most likely version, you'd also like to probably 
put it um, at a region of relatively low rates of change so that if you have small changes, the sensitivity doesn't kill your whole calculation. You can see that most of the parameter sets are doing neither of those. So it's, it, we see this as a design tool. It's a way to explore and describe the sensitivity in the very high dimensional design space and guide choices that get, make when you're, get made when you're um, trying to develop new models for biomolecular simulation, small molecule simulation, things like that. Okay, so I have about 10 minutes or five minutes. Okay, so um, five minutes I'll tell you about uh, Dr. Strangelove. So all of the rest of this talk, all the previous part of this talk was focused on uncertainty being bad, uncertainty being something that I need to beat down um, and you know, take choices away from users or you know, be able to quantify with very elegant methods. Um, the last part of the talk is, is sort of the, the flip side of that. Well, what happens if I take some of the uncertainty that's out there, particularly in model space, where model could represent parameter choices or it could just you know, talk all those different models I talked about at the start, what happens if I ask, can I put those together in a way that gives me the best possible um, performance? And I wouldn't be talking about it if the answer wasn't yes. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is an example of doing this. Uh, so in the first case, we, we took those same poor 17 molecules and beat on them again. Um, but we wanted to understand, is there a way to bring together in a statistical framework um, different ways of modeling the system and play the weaknesses against the strengths and come up with a model that had better overall performance. And in fact, the answer again is yes. Um, this graphic is highly stylized because we were able to sneak into the journal a figure that in the legend says that the data was represented as a fleet of imperial um, <laughs> TIE fighters and they didn't take it out, it was great. Um, but th this is the approach we use. It's called a Bayes model averaging approach. We take the different models um, so our input methods, let's say we have P of them, right? If you think about how you mix and match those P methods, you could actually come up with two to the P minus one combinations. Now, the one that uses every single one of the methods is probably overfit. And the one that uses the best method is what you would do anyway. So this method is only gonna be useful if it finds a way to avoid overfitting and perform better than the best method. That's our criteria for success. So this is essentially just another regression approach. Um, in this case though, we're gonna build up the contributions of each of the models to each of the predictions by looking at their ability to capture the data, essentially in a least squares type of approach, while also penalizing for overfitting through something called the Bayes information criterion. So this is going to be kind of the workhorse piece. So models, you could have a model that performs very, very well, but it uses so many different methods that it's essentially overfit. That would get penalized. But if you had a small combination of models that do pretty well, you would get the bonus from them fitting the data well, but not get penalized for having too many models in there. The other thing we used was model pruning, which is also a very important process, um, trying to understand not only what is the best combination, but uh, what is the most uh, parsimonious combination of models so that we're not, you know, if we don't have to use, throw the kitchen sink in there too, that would be great. So we used that same data set. This time we used 45 small molecules, but same original data set, 49 prediction methods. And we took a subset of uh, those 49 prediction methods that were sort of maximally independent. A lot of people would submit the same um, method with slightly different parameter sets, so the results were highly correlated. So this is a list of the results, and then this down here shows how different models contributed as we went through the pruning process. So you can see how we could throw out models um, at a certain stage if they weren't contributing enough new information, new accuracy, and that was another way to deal with overfitting. So this is the fleet of Imperial TIE fighters, and the exciting thing is that, okay, we, we see that if we include all the methods, right, um, we have a way to represent it. We have a way to minimize for overfitting. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's pretty cumbersome. This includes all 17 of those. This is the single best model. And very quickly, we come up with an ensemble that has relatively few contributions. In fact, it has two contributions. 
and it performs much, much better than the best performing method. So, you know, I probably am going to get my, my PCHEM PhD card or you know, my, my membership card revoked for throwing all physics out the window. But in terms of doing a practical approach to predicting quantities that people need, and you know, the, the drug designers would always kind of throw down the gauntlet that if, if you can't get better than one KT per air, we don't want to talk to you. Um, this is a way to actually get down to some of those air limits. So it's a way to, to improve the state of the field. It's, it's totally unappealing if you want to learn something mechanistic about the system. Although by analyzing this ensemble, you kind of can learn where things work and don't. So, so anyway, that's, um, that, that's what we learned there. Uh, we also applied it to uh, protein um, PKA data. This is something that Chase helped out with. Um, going through and, uh, and understanding if we could go from small molecules to big molecules. Um, the approach works pretty well there as well, otherwise I wouldn't be showing it to you. Um, this is a breakdown of how those things performed. Uh, again, BMA beats all of the individual methods. Um, this was an interesting, I'll, I'll make one more social comment here. Uh, the, the, uh, the computational biology community loves competitions, um, but competitions often kill progress in a field because people engineer their methods for the competitions. Um, so we had the kinder, gentler approach. We, we formed a co-op, a bunch of us in the community, and we get together in Telluride every other year. And so as a result, we, we had kind of an embargo. So I can't tell you who contributes to each of these. I can just show you the results. And it was a nice way to deal with the problem that the community would start to eat itself by trying to win in this competition and the, the, the results being used to inform success at NIH and things like that. So I didn't come up with that. Uh, Bertrand Garcia Moreno, who donated most of the data, um, is the person who came up with that. But it, it was an interesting uh, uh, social outcome. Everyone was very happy with this because you know they don't get singled out. This person wanted to be singled out because they did a really good job, but we didn't let them. So, um, so that, that kind of gives you the, the overall picture of, of what we were after. We wanted to understand and help users with uncertainty when it popped up and how they used a model or how they used a tool. Um, we also wanted to be able to get a handle on the uncertainty that creeps in from the way you set up these models and from things you can't control or bound in like the protein input structure. And then finally understand what's the, you know, can we use some of this uncertainty here? And diversity is probably a better word uh, for this last uh, point. Can we use some of this diversity uh, to help us, to improve accuracy, to complement uh, one model with another model that's, that's better performing in another area. Um, so again, I want to uh, thank everyone who contributed this, but particularly um, the bulk of what I talked about was driven by uh, Xu Yang and Juan Lei and uh, really benefited from this DOE Oscar project for which uh, George Karniadakis is, uh, is the PI and, uh, and uh, we all work for George. So um, with that, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, um, the way we build up the, um, the, the covariance matrix is we actually use an anisotropic B factor type of matrix because we want to allow for different fluctuations in different um, directions, but the, the diagonal elements are all equal. Um, making them unequal does very little, but what would mess us up, so to, to find, you know, if, if you were looking for a caveat, what would mess us up would be like an NMR structure, right? So the models from an NMR structure um, are often kind of random. Um, and we would need to be able to stitch them together in such a way that we could build out that covariation, understand the form of the distribution. Is it Gaussian? No, probably not. Um, and, and that's a case that it's kind of an open area where we haven't gone yet. Yeah. And you're only getting to the top 20 models of the NMR structure. Exactly. Anyway, how many models do you need to meet that? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, um, it kind of depends on how much variation is captured in them, right? And so, um, 
if it was crambin, which is probably the world's most boring protein, you can actually boil water off from around crambin, um, it's pretty rock solid. So those 20 may capture most of the variation because there just isn't much there. But if it had a flexible loop or a disordered region, it would obviously take a lot more. Oh, you know the answer to that. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, the B factors are used to hide sins, right? Um, so in a perfect world, if you have a very high resolution structure, right? So suppose it's a, it's a neutron-based structure where you can resolve hydrogens and things like that. The B factors may actually be interpretable as B factors because alongside those, you'll get things called multiple occupancies that'll say, you know, that this atom was both here and there, which means it must have two states. But in the absence of that type of information, the B factors are rolling in all of the, f the fitting error, right? And so um, they're a proxy. It basically, you know, what, what we started with is let's say we're a user, we download this file, all of the information we're going to get is contained in this file. How do we represent the uncertainty? In a perfect world, you might use a higher resolution structure, run some molecular dynamics. There's, there's a lot of other things you could do. Panos. You could take a I warned David. Maybe let, let me, let's take the streaming out of that. So, so you have a, like a heterogeneous data set. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, we're, we're by no means the, the first people to use base model averaging. And a lot of it's been used for things like climate data, um, understanding power grid data where you don't have a perfect model for different parts of the grid because you don't know all the social behavior. Um, for subsurface models where you can't observe all of the structure underground. So um, the approach itself is extremely generalizable. Um, in fact, there's folks here who use it a lot in biostatistics. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty powerful. Now, the, the streaming part of your question is what really kind of interested me because it, you know, that, that also assumes that you have to have a cache, right? And, and would your distribution of models change you know, as, 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 as you, things move into and out of the cache? And I have no clue. Yeah, we definitely have different groups of parameters. So really, you know, the first part said we can use physics to pick which parameters we're going to constrain, okay? So, so we used physics to drive how we were going to pick those because there were lots of ways to pick them. The second part, the one where we talked about radii and charges, that actually gets at the point that you're describing, which is that often those parameters come in a set. One set might be called ZAP9. Another set might be called OPLS. And... Um, that's what we were trying to g grasp was the fact that these parameters aren't individually tweakable things. They're, they come as a collection. Is, is that what you were asking? No, I think what, what, I'm, what I'm asking is it's often possible to pare down, let's say, from 10 to 4, but you can choose them in different ways to very similar. Right, and so we used physics by, by using, using the variational principle and the, the optimization of the, you know, no, the, the, the solvent distribution through the geometric flow framework, that made the choice for us which degrees of freedom we were throwing out. There was only really one way to couple those two models and that made physical sense, and that, that mechanism of coupling made the choice for us which degrees of freedom we were throwing away, which parameters we were throwing away. Thanks.